we're going to do a low-tech talk about technology. Uh, I guess my, uh, my funny little story to continue where Barbara was is um, last night Francis comes up to me and thanks me uh, for agreeing to give this talk and about 10 minutes later uh, in sort of the spirit of the good cop, bad cop, Jeff Trent comes up to me and gives me his condolences uh, for having to give a technology talk at this meeting. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, in 1900, uh, David Hilbert, the famed uh, German mathematician, presented a prophetic paper at an International Congress in Paris regarding his vision for his field in the 20th century. In his uh, introduction, he noted that every real advance goes hand in hand with the invention of sharper tools and simpler methods. I would like to focus my remarks on some of the sharper tools and simpler methods that we require to translate the output of the Human Genome Project into a true revolution in biomedical research. My point of view will be from the perspective of an end user who believes that the systematic and comprehensive approaches that have characterized genomics programs need to be translated into a framework that can be that can enable scalable, more quantitative biological research. I'll address some of the, fun, some of the technical and methodological changes with respect to tools, resources, and processes that must be addressed in order to arrive at the next level of understanding. <coughs> Given time constraints, this will be a, a bottom-up view of technology that is in no way exhaustive and will intentionally defer discussions of a number of obvious genomics technologies to other speakers or breakout groups. In addition to discussing technology, per se, I'll address a number of sociological issues, as I call them, relevant to the ongoing problems associated with technology development, implementation, and access. I think to date, the principal goal of the Human Genome Project has been the enumeration of the objects of biology, defining genes, genomes, and their products, as well as describing the rudimentary behavior. These efforts, directed at building the infrastructure in the form of resources and tools, have been motivated by, I think, our collective desire to deconstruct biological processes into the molecular components. I believe that the key challenge for the coming century, uh, so this is the 2220 talk, uh, I believe the key challenge for the coming century will be to establish complete molecular descriptions of biological processes that are sufficiently quantitative and dynamic to enable predictive modeling or simulation of that process. To achieve this end, we will need to move away from the study of individual molecular components as the fundamental unit of research. Instead, the new focus will become macromolecular assemblies of increasing complexity, defined as both physical entities as well as functional units. That is to say that our attention will need to move towards pathways, networks, molecular machines, organelles, and eventually the cell itself as a unit of work. In order for achieve what will essentially be a four-dimensional description of biology, our technology must enable us to be not only more quantitative and system-focused, but also will require that we abandon destructive methods for studying cell biology and gene function. Such capabilities, quite frankly, are, are well beyond our current technologies and the future developments that will enable us to directly view biological processes at this molecular level are predicated on our ability to interface with other disciplines. We need to proactively leverage developments in other fields, such as material science, MEMS technology, nanotechnology, optics, as well as polymer and small molecule chemistry. It is clear to me that the near-term goals of the Human Genome Project will be to complete the catalog of the molecular objects. This catalog will not only include genomes, genes, and gene products, but information on natural variation and reversible covalent modifications. It will also be important to expand this cataloging effort to include other cellular constituents, for example, metabolites. A key driver for investment implementation of genomics technology has been the attempt to reduce the time and effort an individual scientist spends creating and assembling reagents, resources, and information necessary to design and perform an experiment. The logical extension of the current efforts will eventually lead to elimination or trivialization of classical tasks associated with molecular biology research, I think freeing the hands as well as the minds of the community to focus on a new class of problems. There are a number of technology-related initiatives worth considering in the nearer term that will significantly enhance biological research and essentially force us to confront these more significant uh, technology challenges. For example, while there are current efforts focus on assembling collections of full-length cDNAs and deploying them into universal vector systems that readily support a variety of tasks, I believe that we ultimately need to develop efficient and cost-effective methods for complete gene synthesis. Such tools will simplify sample tracking issues, reagent distribution, and storage, as well as enhance our ability to manipulate gene and genome sequence in support of experimental objectives. In a similar spirit, we will need to consider systematic efforts to create expanded antibody or antibody-like reagent sets directed against all proteins and all essential molecular determinants. These efforts will also challenge our ability to correctly express large numbers of proteins in both large and small quantities, a skill set that cannot be underestimated. Given the relatively large size of antibodies and the difficulty of introducing antibodies into cells, 
there are significant limitations in their uses as biological tools to quantitate or monitor in vivo intracellular activities. Alternatives will need to be explored, and it is likely that there will be a collection of approaches required for regenerating a robust genome-wide set of reagents. I think some areas worth exploring include approaches for directly labeling proteins such as chimeric protein strategies, such as the GFP fusion strategies, methods that enable us to systematically incorporate modified amino acids, for example, fluorescently labeled amino acids into proteins, or improved methods uh, or for in vivo strategies for covalently modifying a protein using chemical methods. Clearly, the delivery of such reagents into a cell with accurate incorporation into the cellular compartment of choice with appropriate level of activity and maintenance of normal biological function represents significant issues that will need to be addressed. Another alternative to antibodies would be the application of, for example, small molecule chemistry, polymer chemistry, or nanotechnology to help us develop reagents and tools to selectively follow or explore the functional activity and dynamics of molecular components and biological processes. Such reagents could be used to indirectly label proteins by selective bi binding. Um, by selective binding, blocking, or activation of protein activity, or monitor protein function by acting as a substrate or sensor or reporter of a selected activity. These represent a very powerful subset of tools that are generally not available or accessible to academic researchers and are well worth considering. The fundamental strategies for studying gene function require us to modulate or alter a gene or gene product's activity or expression. It is certain that we will see an acceleration and expansion of such activities dedicated to, to generating genome-wide collections or deploying systematic methods for global gene knockouts in model organisms or cell lines. The advent of RNA interference and improvements in antisense technology are examples of scalable technologies that are available in the here and now and merit immediate exploitation. In addition, I think we can anticipate improvements in gene and protein switch technology that will enable regulated and perhaps more importantly tunable and reversible modulation of gene and protein activity. These features will be based not only on classical molecular biology methods, but will increasingly employ small molecule agonist antagonists as a source of the tunability. Disruption of function by any of these methods place significant demands on our ability to quantify the dynamics of gene and gene product activity, as well as the spatial and temporal dynamics of synthesis and turnover. This technical gap is really the Achilles heel of our current biology with respect to uh, extracting the type of information we will require for a more complete description of biologic processes. Tools such as mass spectroscopy or chip-based profiling, chip profiling paradigms that can globally monitor in parallel changes in aspects of the activity of molecular components deserve increased intention, but are only part of the answer. Such technologies are limited by cost issues as well as by the current status of our separation and purification technologies. Furthermore, these processes are examples of destructive testing, and it's very likely that the new biology begins just beyond the reach of some of these technologies. Before we leave the discussion of immediate technology goals, I want to consider some near-term issues in cell biology, as I believe at least over the next 20 years, the cell itself will become our primary unit of work. I believe the fundamental issue is actually the cell lines themselves, and we clearly need a better biological and genetically characterized resource. I will suggest that the current revolution in stem cell biology will represent the logical place for the development of a more robust set of cellular reagents that accurately reflect underlying biology. Another area that needs to be addressed is the translation of cell-based assays into single-cell formats, enabling a more quantal approach to biological research. In addition, we'll need to improve our ability to manipulate, separate, and sort single cells or small quantities of cells, and I expect that this is an area where MEMS technology will have a tremendous and perhaps immediate impact. I'd like now to turn my attention away from issues relating to reagents, tools, and process in order to consider what I'll call the sociological issues surrounding technology. One of the most important consequences of the genomics initiatives has been the introduction of high-throughput process technologies to the discovery phase of research. The increasing reliance on mechanical automation, instrumentation, laboratory information management systems has had a significant impact on the workplace making issues of operation, organization, and diversification of intellectual capital quite frankly part of the competitive mix. I think we would all agree that one of the current facts of life is that ongoing access to a broadly defined and well-integrated technology base is a competitive advantage. Furthermore, uh, narrowing technology life cycles and increasing expectations of productivity suggests that technology is not only indispensable, but quite frankly it's increasingly disposable. As a consequence, when contemplating technology investments, we must not only consider the development or acquisition of technology, 
but almost would pay attention to the issues surrounding the integration and maintenance of such a platform. This emerging reality is another, a number of important implications. It is clear that groups of investigators will need increased levels of resources and increased flexibility and freedom to operate with respect to deployment of both financial as well as intellectual capital. In the case of larger centers, in order to maintain critical mass, longer term stable sources of funding, not necessarily tied to grant cycles, will need to be identified. If the system does not change, it is very likely we'll witness emergence of quasi-private research institutes, institutes loosely affiliated with major academic centers. Such centers will develop their own endowments and will not only have more direct control over the resources and intellectual property, but will have increased flexibility to develop partnerships with the private sector. As a consequence, the university will have significantly reduced its access to technology, risk losing some of its best faculty and students, and the gap between the haves and have-nots will only increase. The expanded need for capital creates a number of interesting challenges as well as opportunity. One of the ironies of raising very large sums of money is that the ultimate decision makers are not only forced to choose between a vast array of diverse options, but are unlikely to be able to judge a funding opportunity on its technical merit. As a consequence, psychological factors such as credibility, vision, popular opinion, or conventional wisdom have a significant impact in decision making. In such an environment, public relations and positioning become essential tactics, and we really can't ignore these issues. For example, do you think it is easy to raise money for biological research in the context of a technology bubble when the public is focused on human cloning, bioterrorism, or genetic pollution? Another example of how public positioning or guidance by the NHGRI or similar groups can significantly impact technology development is respect to the private sector investment. The single largest source of discretionary funds dedicated to novel technology development can be found in the venture capital community. Venture capitalists are not a collection of futurists or technology gurus but are highly tuned sensors of the leading edge of emerging consensus. As a consequence, clear articulation of programmatic vision by groups such as this will influence the course of investment, creating not only a pull on technology, but a significant multiplier effect on investment. Finally, from the perspective of technology development and distribution as well as access to capital, it is important that we pay increased attention to the interfaces between the public and private sector. For example, an area in need of immediate attention is the management of technology licensing and intellectual property. We view this as a problem of asset management and compare the level of experience and the resources available to the university offices that manage the endowment of the university to the resources and personnel associated with the Office of Technology and Licensing. One immediately understands the source of the well-recognized problems such as establishing partnerships, ensuring flow of information and technology, as well as encumbering or fragmenting uh, intellectual property portfolios. In summary, I believe the near-term technology investments and developments represent logical extensions of current efforts designed to compile the catalog of molecular objects as well as to eliminate traditional tasks associated with molecular and cellular biology. As we complete this program and begin to address issues associated with creating more quantitative biology, a significant number of technical issues will need to be tackled that require exploration of an array of emerging technologies associated with fields traditionally outside of biomedical research. And quite frankly, I think we have to eliminate the trivial tasks before we can focus, before we'll get the community to focus on these more difficult tasks. All of this um, technology development is associated with significant cost and will continue to change the fundamentals of our scientific uh, culture. So let me end where I began my remarks with a quote from David Hilbert's famous Paris Address. As long as a branch of science offers an abundance of problems, so long it is alive, a lack of problems foreshadows ex extinction or the cessation of independent development. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, ample opportunity for uh, said less than 30 minutes. questions, reflections, I reactions. In a world where you only have 15 minutes to pitch anything. <laughs> We'll start with you and again. If, if people don't know, I, I always have a question. Um, so, um, from from my perspective, one of the interesting technologies that that we want to get our, our hands on is is oh, sorry, got to stand up. Uh, small molecule technologies, and you've mentioned some of them uh, in passing. And of course, it's, there's a lot of existing small molecule technologies all buried inside these wonderful pharmaceutical companies. And uh, again, we, we don't want to do the same thing as pharmaceutical companies. We, we just want molecules that are going to mess up the cell or going to 
kind of bind things or going to do all sorts of things. That's what you think. <laughs> okay, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but um, I can't suggest that we go off and steal as we can with our academic computational side uh, stuff from them because that's probably illegal. But there seems to be an opportunity of 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 coming to some partnership with with a very big existing technology base that currently is is sort of is very much kept behind the you know, it's, it's not accessible to academics. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how to unlock that uh, uh, potential. Well, I think, I think you make a very good point. That's one of the points I want to make sure out here is that I think whatever people call chemical genetics, chemical genomics, or just old-fashioned pharmaceutical chemistry, these molecular tools are the most scalable, available tools we have for sort of modulating gene activity and doing all these fun things like creating biological sensors. Uh, what people lose, it's actually n not a big barrier as you think to academics to get into chemistry these days because as much as we take pride in sort of the genome project, what we forget is the same thing happened to chemistry in the 1980s. So the development of common material chemistry, the application of high throughput process technologies, the screening, et cetera, et cetera, all happened in the 1980s. And a lot of the drive for genomics technologies uh, by the pharmaceutical industry in the 90s was really arising from the fact we have all the screening capacity, how do we get to the next level? Um, what has also happened is, is that a lot of the um, robotics and things that are necessary, both on the screening side, the assay side, and also for the development of these small molecule libraries, um, 10 years ago essentially required 60 or 70 people inside a company like Glaxo to build, and they've all become commoditized. There's a whole set of companies which are called tools companies we do. So for investment on the order of 10 to 15 million dollars, because I've actually done this, one can actually set up a, a really tremendous capacity to generate diversity to screen and, and bring online the sort of necessary know-how to really work in a focus area. So I think it's, it's, it's a false presumption on our part that this is an area that we can't enter into. And, almost, and if you think, of, and almost every academic campus has access to medicinal chemistry know-how and expertise. So I think it's really a question of will more than anything else. And, um, and I think, for example, in many classes of proteins we're interested in, the know-how around building selective inhibitors uh, G, or agonists, G-protein coupled receptors, increasing areas of kinases and proteases is so well advanced that getting relatively selective inhibitors to use as biological tools is something that happens in months. I have many examples in my own organization where we actually made tools within a week um, for doing gene knockouts. And I don't know what technology enables you to do that. So I think it's just a matter of deciding you're going to do it and doing it. You mentioned some of the issues um, that relate to intellectual property in our research, or, or the university research in particular, um, and how, relatively speaking, technology transfer offices are not necessarily, you know, the, the places where the people of greatest wisdom and, and intellect collect. Um, I'll stand by that. <laughs> um, and my question to you is, um, what, can you think of strategies that could be deployed either by the public sector or in a more decentralized fashion that would um, force university presidents really to pay attention to what's going on in technology transfer and perhaps to come together to, to um, come up with some sort of policy for the academic sector? on what they should be doing with respect to technology transfer. Um, because my sense is that technology transfer has sort of been pushed by lower level people and university presidents may not have been paying attention at a, a fairly, uh, or direct attention to the issue. Um, and therefore you have a constant push to get, assert more intellectual property rights and more and more and more, um, and then compete with other universities to assert more and more and more. So I, I want the, wondered if you had any thoughts. Yeah, I think by goal aside, so I don't want to even step on that landmine. Right, right. Um, I think the, the fundamental problem is asymmetric warfare. You can't have the Marines on one side and the Boy Scouts on the other and expect uh, there, to, there to be a, a dialogue of equals to create, to create a system. And I think that's as simply as it gets. 
If you go back into universities and you ask them how they managed their endowments in the 70s and 80s, they all realized that they, they were doing worse in the market. They didn't diversify portfolios, et cetera, et cetera. They brought in professional money managers, and suddenly we have universities with multi-billion dollar endowments because they brought first-line people who get paid the same they would get paid at Goldman Sachs for investing MIT's or Harvard's money. If you don't do the same thing in the technology licensing office, which I would guarantee you is just as much of an asset, and probably a more durable asset than finances, then the market will find other ways. That's why I mentioned the quasi-private kinds of things, because people on their own will figure this out. They will raise their endowments, they will manage their money, and they will manage intellectual property. So I think the way the university have to do is take it seriously. And, what they, and, they, and they can't do an ad hoc. I think one of the greatest dangers is that I think um, there are concerns for, by some universities, particularly medical centers, that they're not deriving enough capital, enough cash. Uh, from their technology licensing. One of the consequences is they end up doing stupid deals, which seems to be very front-end loaded on the cash side, but they actually do two things. One is they, they do not participate in the long term, and they actually create a situation which all of us have lived through the Cree locks and many other technologies of fragmenting and encumbering technologies in a matter because no one thought it through. And so I think if you had parties who were seeing each other as equals, I think the market's efficient enough to come up with methods because the private sector needs the public sector and the public sector needs the private sector. So I think it's actually a relatively simple thing. Yeah. Jeff? One of the things you're talking about is inhibitors. Right. Uh, Well, I think it's one of those journeys of a thousand miles begins with a few step problems. Um, that that uh, if we can't systematically, and, and I use the word tunable because I don't, I, I agree with you. I don't think it's it's a binary system, but be able to in a tunable fashion turn things on and off, which I think ultimately is one of the beautiful things about using small molecules that you probably have a greater dynamic range, particularly in in, in, in cellular kinds of situations to study those problems. And I think if we solve that problem first, we can begin to address the other things. And I would actually err on the side, this comes back to the question of thinking about more selective inhibitors because, you know, one of the biggest problems in drug discovery, quite frankly, is unintended targets. I mean, it is very hard, quite frankly, to um, design a small molecule of three to 400 molecular weight that only hits one kinase and doesn't hit another other things. And so, so the reality is that selectivity from a sort of model system point of view is, is probably better in the near term. And if we can solve that problem, I think the more complex problems begin to, to come on. Jeff, can, yeah, we, can, we, can, we, can we hear your comments on uh, completeness and uh, specifically with the, you know, the, the reference to technology increments, but across the whole range of molecular objects too, not just the human genome? Well, I think, I think uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess if people who work for me uh, know, know I say this probably every single day, is I think perfection is the enemy of good. And, um, and, and I think, I think uh, Dr. Wald said it correctly, is, is that it, it's, it's a bang for the buck issue. Uh, how complete, you know, ulti how complete you want to get totally depends on what's the, how valuable that last yard is. And I have no problem with deferring goals of completeness to a better technology. I think a lot of us make very pragmatic decisions. And I think, you know, that was the big emotional issue around the draft sequence versus the complete sequence was really accepting the fact that the current status of technology meant we could get a 98% solution fairly immediately and we'll defer to the future of the finishing. And so I think we just, I think there, there's a need for pragmatism um, and not, and not uh, dogmatism in, in those kinds of problems. So that's sort of my view of completeness. And I think in terms of the broader notion of completeness, the reason I threw this notion of metabolites and other things is that I think we have too narrow a vision of what in fact um, constitutes molecular objects. I think for most of us it's genes and proteins and, and even proteins is only begrudgingly accepted in the last couple of years as, uh, by molecular biologists, right? And so I think getting broader is actually very, very important because at least as we've done a lot of work on looking at, you know, two, three hundred components in networks, you for, you're being forced to look at other things that are going on in the economy of the cell. 
I mean, I, I, when I come to this point, I always remember in, in Judson's book on, on um, sort of the history of molecular biology, he makes the interesting point that the first 50 years of the last century dealt with the flow of energy, and then we forgot all about that, and we dealt with the flow of information. So at some level, some grand unification has to happen if we're really going to get complete pictures. So I think completeness has to really be translated to comprehensiveness, probably. Jeff? Since you have the uh, ability to be outside of the grant system to some extent, even though you've been on the review side, and I have the same opportunity and as an intramural investigator of not participating. I, I was particularly intrigued with the component of your talk that really might say that our opportunities, especially in technology, we, and I think we all know this, are limited by the current mechanisms of funding. So you sit on these study sessions, you look at them, they're very difficult to fund, they're very difficult to pull together, and it is almost forcing individuals that want to marry these technologies to go to places, as you mentioned, which are either quasi-academic, sit somehow between these, and what that does, in my opinion, is marginalize the government's role in stimulating the process. So have you thought of ways to suggest to people like Francis in the front row and others, uh, institute directors here, how they could uh, help the team building or other approaches where the uh, maybe the R01 component is, is only one of the measurements for this? Um, I mean, I think I think you ha the problem is is um, I think ultimately I think here's the problem I think we're facing is that and this comes back to the compression of technology life cycles is any of us who sat in any of the sequencing uh, study sections knows is that by the time the grants got there in response to some RFA six months ago the technology has changed you know I sat in the study section where all of a sudden 96 well capillary electrophoresis was the, the technology de rigueur, and every single grant here was irrelevant. And that is happening continuously. And so that's why I think ultimately we have to think about providing larger sums of discretionary money and, and that are unlinked from the grant cycle. I think this is, whether you call it endowment, call it what you want, but we have to think about, particularly in these larger centers, way that people can smooth their expense, make, make Make you know forward-looking decisions. I mean, let's let's be let's be frank about it. If we if we really want to get bold about technology, you got to buy technology, and and um, and we realize that sort of 99% of what we do at any one time is probably wrong. It's just that we don't know which 99%, and so that's really the, the sort of challenge that we have. So um, I think that's ultimately what we need is we have to figure out a way, whether it's through private funding, whether it's through government mechanisms, to create discretionary funds that allow people to take the chances. We used to talk about in R01 grants that we work on our next grant, but that really, that's okay when it takes $10,000 to start a pilot project. But, you know, I just know some work that we've done, for example, what I'll call cellular genetics, you know, thinking about how to um, knock out every gene in cell lines. Well, that required us to bring in-house a lot of, of sort of micro-injection equipment and things like that. I mean, we decided on a Thursday, someone was in Germany the week later, and two weeks later this, everything is set up, and you started doing the experiment. If you have to wait 18 to 24 months, why do it? So you can't, and you can't do that $10,000. You need a half a million dollars or something just to get started. So I think we're just going to have to fundamentally change our view of the peer-reviewed system, and maybe ultimately what we have to do is distribute responsibility and trust the quality of our investigators to make wise decisions and be accountable for them. Uh, uh, Jeff, I, uh, I hear with the interest your uh, comment on the raising of capital and right. the managerial part of science, and uh, I understand how um, in, in the type of position you are occupying, you have to think on a large scale. Right. Uh, but I'm worried about the loss of individuality, and um, when I think back, uh, we wouldn't be here except for three individuals uh, at the present time, and um, Maxim and Gilbert and Sanger. Right. And those were individuals. They weren't big conglomerates of people uh, making advanced high-throughput technology. So how do you envision uh, using the resources of, uh, of uh, you might say, the commercial section uh, uh, to generate the individual ideas rather than the, uh, the larger scale one. Well, I'll make it what I think will be a controversial comment. I believe big science guarantees the life of small science, and this is why. Uh, I recently gave a talk at the Miller College of Wisconsin. Uh, Howard Jacobs invited me, and, and I talked about some work we did in angiogenesis and about a, a, lot, of, a lot of, let's say, a, a saturation genetic screen across a particular pathway, which was quite impressive because it used a collection of complete knockout set of genes in Drosophila and complete knockouts in zebrafish. So Howard raised his hand and he said, well, how many people did that project? And my answer was three. 
And, the, and that's the size of a small lab and a small group. Why did three people do those projects? Because they had access to an infrastructure which actually could generate tools, resources, and reagents. So I don't think every bit of science has to be done in sort of an industrialized process. Quite frankly, industrialized processes are great for uh, sequencing the genome, but the kind of feedback and correction systems we need in biology are not. But quite frankly, small investigators are equally enabled by large science. So I think what we have to do is find ways that you can, people can remain affiliated. And I think if you look at universities, uh, MIT, I think Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, Baylor, the NHGRI, where there are big centers that have all these things, I think the, the, the unintended consequence is that the small labs or the creativity and the drive, the things, actually benefit disproportionately in many ways. Uh, so again, big science, I think, guarantees small science as long as we assure access and somehow. And access doesn't have to be every investigator has the $100 million budget. It means they have access to some center that actually does. My, my question is sort of about the completeness issue. And, right. <clears throat> uh, in, in its larger context that you really brought up, I sort of feel like that the technology, we can have a very robust uh, feeling about how that's going to be developed and, and then the completeness aspect comes down to um, okay so we've got all of the genes, we've got all the transcripts, we've got all the tissues, we've got all the embryonic stages but from which organisms and how are we going to do that across a diversity and do we need to think about we, we clearly can't do that over all organisms, but can we, what about, the, what about stem cells? Can we make stem cells from all organisms? Or how will we actually provide a, a finite resource that will allow the breadth uh, uh, with, without, you know, saying that the whole ecosphere is our laboratory, without uh, making some uh, uh, strategic choices, choices that need to be made sooner rather than later, and all of this in the face of the pragmatism that you're so devoted to. Right. Well, I think the choice is ultimately a question of economics. You know, if uh, sequencing costs a millionth of a cent a base, then I think evolutionary biologists would go out and sequence as many things as they can find and develop reagents and resources for everything. So um, I think from a pragmatic point of view, I think people have to make their, I guess I'm arguing for your own choice. I mean, I'm very lucky in some sense is that I understand the boundary conditions in which I work, and so that's how I can direct my choices. So what I think we're trying to, when I talk about technology, I think it is the preservation of choice, ultimately. Uh, and completeness should be, it's a point of view question. You know, what is complete for me and what I need to do my task is linked to the process that I engage in. But everyone here has their own scientific sort of point of view, and that's where completeness is. I don't know, if, I don't think we can come in this room and, and come to a definition of what complete is. I mean, you know, there are whole mathematical disciplines dealing with the concept of completeness, and we can't even approach that level of clarity. So I think it's really point of view and, and opinion, so I don't even know where to, you know, to, to draw a line. What you're, what you're trying to predict. In the, in the last 20 years, right. I would, would have said there has been a significant shift in the culture in science. I think you standing up here, in fact, is a perfect example of what you've been able to do with your company. And I think we saw that perhaps most profoundly when Francis Collins would not cave in on the access of the data that was supported through the public taxpayer in this country. And that is something that we've benefited from. At the same time, there was another culture that has become increasingly stronger in this country. And I think the generation looking behind me has pretty much experienced a significant shift in that culture from when they were trained as scientists to now what we see as the business of science. And that when we talk about technology transfer and we talk about what's going in the ac academic environment, I think we are really seeing a significant change of not the Boy Scouts versus, who was on the other end? Marines. The Marines. Yeah, I'm not sure I would have made that analogy, certainly not today. But rather a grayness of who used to be the good guys and who used to be the bad guys. And part of this is because we grew up, many of us, in the 60s and the 70s. So did I. And so, I mean, and so did you. Right? Well, you're, you're wearing blue jeans, right? So, and so, and, and I don't think there are necessarily good guys and bad guys now because I think we've changed some of our definitions and we've changed some of our contexts. 
So what I need to ask you is I need to ask you to look 20 years from now or mm -hmm. which, um, and to tell me what's going to happen with that culture. Because when you said we should basically give a blank check to either investigators to do what they think is fine, I think the public would buy that if they thought that they would get a financial benefit from that. But if we give, the, if the public gives us as scientists a blank check and instead we're fighting about whether there is then going to be access to the information, I don't think the trust of the public is going to be what it is today. And in fact, it isn't today. It, the, and what is it today? So I want you to look 20 years from now and tell me where do you think our public policy is going to be then in terms of the access to the technology and what impact is that going to have on science? Well, I think one of the good news is that if, if any of the gene patents actually uh, issue in 20 years, they're irrelevant because of GATT. So I think uh, time in some level is on our side. Um, Quite, you know, and, and I just want to make it very clear. I'm not advocating a, bri a blank check. What I'm advocating is that we think very deeply, you know, that w how, what proportion of someone's research budget is ultimately discretionary. And, that, and just because of the nature of the science we do, it can't be the $10,000 we sort of squirreled away from the American Cancer Society grant, but it, it's, it, it's going to have to be a larger sum of money. And ultimately, you are accountable how you do it. There is an investor in you. I mean, whether it's a private sector investment or the government, you're going to have to stand up in front of your peers and decide. So it's not a blank check. It's just it's really an issue of freedom to operate that respects the, the current dynamics. Um, this, the grain is, I don't know if it's a bad thing, honestly. Uh, between, between, I don't think that, you know, if we, if we act like Franciscan monks uh, in terms of our science, the public's not going to care. And given the, the, the bucks that we need, even in the, uh, in, the, in the academic sector, to do this, the public has, this is my point, when, you, when I made this thing about, when I made the point about trying to raise large sums of money and sort of the ironic thing that the people make a decision about where to spend it, it is ultimately the public. I mean, to give the size of the budgets we're going to need for the NIH and other kind of uh, institute, it has to compete with almost any other big ticket item. So the public has to believe good things are coming out of it and good things are benefits to human health, they are learning, and quite frankly, they are things that stimulate the economy and those things are tied together. And part of the reason there is this grayness is that investigators, and, you know, this is the reason I eventually had to leave Harvard when I was there, is that at some point you have to decide whether you're a player or you're a spectator. In this, in this business, and if, and if you can't access capital through one source, you're looking through another. And so I think part of the greatness has to do with the kinds of compromises that you have to make an investigator just to do it. And that's why I think the quasi-private road is one that's probably going to happen, because the market forces are forcing people there. So unless the cost of research gets significantly compressed down so we can work again in small budgets, it's going to be hard to divorce ourselves from the greatness. And, and I just think it's an inevitable consequence of, of, of how things are. And this has happened in other areas. The only difference between what happened in big science and physics was they were more relevant to the Cold War and, and the defense industry, so the money cycled in another way. Here we're cycling in what is predominantly a private sector activity, which is related to health care in the pharmaceutical industry, so it just addresses a different set of markets. And I think that's the reality of having big, expensive technology-based science. And, and I, so I think I think the grayness becomes more gray, quite frankly. So 20 years is going to be grayer than it is. I believe I think it will be grayer than it is today. And I think part of it is is there's increased cycling back and forth. I mean I look I mean and it, and it's interesting. We 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 think of the you know if I ever told you who the biggest investors in venture funds are, they're the endowment funds at all your universities. It is Tia Kreff. I mean if you actually look at the composition of your investors, it's all you people. Uh, and I've actually and I actually think if you stood up here and asked how many people actually are on the scientific advisory boards of one or a number of pharmaceutical biotech companies, I would think that some fraction of people's discretionary income are derived from it every way. So, you know, I think it's, it's a very gray area and only gets grayer. And the cycling back and forth between is, is remarkable. I hire people, they're choosing between an academic job or a job in biotechnology and they're there a couple of years and their second job is between biotechnology and academics. I think that's why it's going to be gray. Um, so, sort of uh, to, to, get, to get back a little to the technology. Sure. Um, there, there are two things I think that, that might have been missed over a little bit. One is that there's both observation and manipulation technologies, and I think you addressed that very well at the cellular level. Right. But I think for this group, we also need to be thinking at 
the other two higher levels of biological inference, the individual and the population. Absolutely. And the technologies for uh, analysis and manipulation at the cellular level may not necessarily be the same as the ones at the population and at the, the whole organism level. So we need to be thinking maybe about three different areas of targeting our, our technology. That's a good point. And I purposely said I was doing it top, bottom up, and right. would go there. But I think, I think the problems just get harder as you get. Um, so that we can start to attack some of those problems. The other one is that actually, uh, you know, Francis showed this slide about Tom Watson's comment about how many computers he could imagine, uh, the other Watson, um, how many computers uh, he could imagine. He was actually correct uh, at the level of capital investment that was necessary Absolutely. for the way those computers were built at that point in time and the fact that you needed 10 PhDs in electrical engineering to run the darn things. Uh, there really was a market of that. And what has changed since then is the way that we build our computers and the way that we have the knowledge base uh, for computation as operating systems that are inherent within the machines. So I think if we break out of the mentality that uh, biological instrumentation must be big and must be capital investment, we might be able to get back to the idea that individuals have the capacity to change rapidly, just like you can buy a new computer uh, every 18 months, perhaps. Um, that same notion of changing our biological technology is a function of how we construct the machines rather than the machines themselves. Yeah, and I think what you're saying, this sort of uh, mainframe the PC mentality, you'll begin to see right now in, in, in instrumentation. I know of several companies that, are, for example, have built desktop cell sorters uh, with the size of your computer that uh, probably will cost fifty to sixty thousand dollars compared to the equivalent Beckton Dickinson type of machine, and I think you'll completely see that trend. But that's sort of a natural process of technology, decreasing footprints and costs, and I think that will result in the commoditization. I think ultimately, at the sort of cutting edge, let's say breadboard level of technology development, that's still going to remain expensive. But it's also why we think we need the private sector because you're not going to be able to take the device you invent in your laboratory and put it in a, and shrink wrap it and put it in a box and sell it for $15,000 or whatever. So I think you're right. I think that's what's going to happen. And, and there will be a, a greater distribution of technology. Um, one of the questions are is availability of technology and what species would do we do? Right. I mean, do we do everybody's favorite species? And just as a suggestion is that if we followed your model, which is, if you'll allow me to paraphrase it, a few labs having most money and the tools, that you could develop a ship time model. In other words, if you're an oceanographer, you can't afford that ship to go to Antarctica. What you do is you get two weeks on a ship. Right. And so one model I would like to suggest is that a ship time model. That is, you lease me your laboratory space for two weeks and me and five people come and beat the hell out of your equipment. I think it's already happening. You know, for example, one of the biggest advances in X-ray crystallography, and we take advantage of this, is the use of synchrotron radiation to generate structures, you can use smaller crystals. In the Bay Area, both Berkeley and uh, Stanford have synchrotron lines. You know, you pay for a subscription and you bring your crystals and you, make, and you, go, and, and you go there. They still do big time research, but everyone benefits. And I think that is a model that will work. Yeah, Tom. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to uh, go back to the, the sociology issue that you brought up and that Karen elaborated on and that others have elaborated on. and and, and so, urge you to actually cast your net even more broadly than you already did um, and make a couple of points here. One is that the, the suggestion that the universities get their acts together better in terms of how they think about tech transfer is something that we need to acknowledge is not a costless event. Mm -hmm. um, and that it is probably, it, it probably is not true currently that, that the academy is this, uh, this uh, pillar or bastion of um, totally altruistic in inquiry. Um, but, it, but I think that we need to recognize that as we move more and more to the issue of a more entrepreneurial academy, which we very clearly are in this era, that it does raise profound issues for conflict of interest for, uh, and for how science is um, done and how information is shared and other things like that. And we need to sort of take that into our calculus as we move in that direction. We also need to take into our calculus that when we move technology or research out of the out of the public sector and into the private sector, that that goes that there goes with it 
um, a removal from the area of public discourse that I think is incredibly important in our country. And I'll just bring a provocative example to place right now, which is that if we're not going to do stem cell biology in the public sector, we will do it in the private sector. And what we will lose is the transparency and available to public discourse that we desperately need to have and that, in fact, the area of assisted reproductive technology has gone some of the ways it's gone because it's been entirely in the private sector and unregulated. So I've been one for arguing that the public needs specifically to address these extremely controversial areas so that we can do it in a way that's open to um, further discussion. And the third point that I would make is, and I, I'm going to quote David Botstein on this, which will make those of you who know me laugh a lot. Um, <laughs> but one of the first things I ever remember him saying was that you know, as we move to the big biology and as we move to the, you know, uh, small centers, uh, as, as we move to the huge centers, that we will be eating our seed corn. Um, and I think we be mind, need to be mindful of that, harking back to the comment that was made earlier. It is true, that I think, that the big science will guarantee the small science. But I think that to the extent that the, um, that the, the big science sort of entrains the younger scientists into the big science system, their costs affiliated with that. Um, and that and that's particularly problematic in a time where as we do the biology and as we do the science, we need to think not only about the genomics of individual organisms, we need to think about um, the interactions between gen genomes of different organisms, between human and bacteria, or between human and parasite, and between genomes in the environment. That, it, I mean, the, the biological problem is phenomenally huge. And so we really, I mean, we need to create the system that allows and even, I'll, I, I mean, I would have painted an even broader skill set than what Barbara painted, that, of what our biologists need. And so I just, as we think about the sociology of the change that we have in mind, we really need to look at these profound impacts on all of our institutions. And, and I think they're, they're really complex. Absolutely. So a, cu a couple of things that think come out of that. I think in the private sector, uh, particularly if you're a public company, you know about accountability in a way that I think very few people here realize. There's a famous, there's a good organization called the SEC, and there's something more imposing called Reg D. And both of those actually have, have and, and both of those make you, as someone said, financially accountable and also legally accountable in a way that you never have to be in a university setting. But I think one of the reasons I made this point about psychological components to raising lots of money is that if we as scientists are not sensitive to those, the public backlash will kill you. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when a lot of very smart molecular biologists went to Australia because they couldn't do molecular cloning uh, in the United States. I mean, the same issues are today with um, uh, human cloning, and quite frankly, some of the biotechnology company CEOs are doing a very bad job, and they only set the, that particular uh, group of research back both in the public and private sector for many years. Because remember, you know, you can't buy a car unless you put gas in it. So if you screw up in the private sector and you piss off the public, do you think a venture capitalist or a uh, any other sell side investors can put any money on you because there's no way they're ever going to get liquidity in a public market. So there are self-regulatory things. They may happen through a different mechanism, may be driven by financial incentives, but unless we in the private sector, you in the public sector are sensitive to it, it doesn't happen. So LC issues, public policy issues, yep, it's all part of the same thing. You can't, you know, you can't get bucks unless you pay attention to those issues. There's no doubt, there's just no doubt in my mind. Hi, so, yes. Peter. So, uh, um, um, about the model big versus small, I think, uh, kind of two questions. Uh, one is, because um, when I get up, I can't forget that question. <laughs> you can sit down. <laughs> no, the, the issue, what's big, what's small, there's actually two, two, two issues. One is, uh, uh, you want to dis uh, dislocate the, um, bring things away from the funding council, the, the cycles. But actually, part of this, the reason of having grants every five years is assure competitiveness. Right. And if you do a big, a big uh, genome standards and so on, and you don't assure a mechanism for competitiveness, you're going to end up with wasting there, too, and also loss of innovation, which could, money could have gone elsewhere. The other one is I do agree there's a certain level. What, what's big, what's small? Is, is big having five genome centers in the country? Or is it one per state? Or is it one per city? Or is it one per each research institute in the city? Because sometimes uh, you have a feeling some cities want to do that. Uh, 
there's an issue of distance. I mean, we are core facility in Montreal for, you know, probably given chip or genotyping services for 100 groups across Canada. But the groups which are next door obviously get much faster service or the turnaround time with analyzing the data is much faster than when it's in Vancouver. So there's the issues of, uh, and I still think that the, the better, the Pulitzer Prize papers are going to come out, not just because we do big projects, but because someone who really knows the system has access to technology. So there's got to be a, a give and take between a big, but so far away or so distant, or access would, would be actually very difficult for people for, uh, it could be a, a real access problem or just a functional access, access problem. So I just hear your thoughts on right. that. So I think there are two. Competition. Yeah. Yeah. They can't hear Questions. Okay, so I think there were two questions in yeah, there. Competition and uh, so uh, both competition, quality assurance, and quality control. I mean, the bottom line, the reason you need to have some discretionary fund is not only for innovation. It's quite frankly, as I stated in my little overview, was critical mass. How do you maintain a staff unless you give them? I think Barbara used the word some certainty and particularly when you need such diverse intellectual capital to go. So that just has to be there to go on, and we're just going to have to develop different ways of oversight. Um, that will penalize people for bad decisions. I think there's something around it. I mean, those of us, uh, as uh, Dr. Geyer mentioned, who've been involved in the sequencing program, I don't know how many uh, intermediate step site visits we do um, to deal with intermittent problems, and, and the feedback is there. So the system will respond. Uh, my feeling is, is that, you know, every so that we need to think of a strategy that gives every scientist access to this technology. Not every big technology center can afford or should have every single available technology to it, but everybody needs access uh, to it, uh, even as a small scientist, more so as a, as a small scientist. So there, I think there are issues of distribution of centers, as you pointed out, and I don't know what the optimal numbers are, but I think um, a lot of it's, but, you know, a lot of it's going to be cost driven. I think just thinking about distribution of reagents and resources. I made this comment about total synthesis of genes and things like that. Part of that is because you can do, you know, obviously what you're more interested in is variant, generating variants of genes and conventional molecular biology doesn't work. But if we hark back to the sort of RFLP versus STS genetic marker days, just, just the physical problems of distributing are, are simplified if you can make them electronic. So I think we have to think about that aspect too, because I think access to technology is also about simplifying the distribution chain as well. And again, that comes to the sort of private public sector because unfortunately or fortunately the commercial sector is probably a little better if it's incentivized appropriately at assuring distribution, but we, there has to be oversight of that. So again, I think everyone needs access. I, I, I just can't see this, I, I, I think this have or have not things will be a very dangerous thing for biology. Yes, uh, talking just about the, uh, the public money. What do you think would be an adequate ratio of money for big projects as opposed to investigator-initiated projects? And I heard what you said about, you know, if you have a large center, it filters down to smaller groups. But still, if you, if let's say a disproportionate amount of the public money goes to these large centers, the amount that's left for investigator-initiated uh, projects is going to be smaller. And uh, related to the investigator-initiated pro uh, projects, I agree with you that the time delay between submission of a grant and the time that you actually do it is too big, but I cannot think of a, a better system than the current peer review system. If you do contracts or, or other things, you end up with uh, unintended side effects. So do you have a suggestion for making the, a full peer review system a little more responsive or, time, or less time intensive? And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, and I think we've seen this in the sequence, I mean, I, I think the NHGRI actually has been a leader in that area because they, you know, I in, mean, in, by defining, for example, I mean, maybe it's, it's a project-specific thing, but I think in terms of the sequencing project, there's been far more ability to ch change the rudder of the ship on in-between grant cycles to move money here, move money there, whatever. So I think, again, it comes back to trusting the people who you're entrusting the money to. That is, uh, to give them some flexibility without having to go back to the central bureaucracy. I mean, it's a big organizational pro I mean, I mean, I always hate when process gets in the way of progress. And I think to a large extent that we, ha that we have these monolithic organizations that are very large that are actually imposing a process that probably makes these things more difficult. So as terms of how much should be small science versus big science, uh, you know, I can't answer that. Uh, I, I actually think it's not a question. I think the pie simply has to get larger if we are going to, if we are going to find a way of pushing the technology out to a broader number of people. And, and I think that's the bigger question, is how do we have a bigger part of the pie, not how do we slice some pie into smaller pieces. 
Among the things I, I believe you mentioned uh, that the public would like to see from us in applications of the Genome Project are he healthcare uh, right. applications. And uh, the challenge or the problem with getting the private sector to drive that is uh, uh, the, the vast majority of genetic diseases don't have the market to in entice major pharmaceutical companies or even uh, biotech companies. Uh, I, I wonder what you see as the, uh, uh, the proper roles of uh, the private sector, the government, and academia in, in taking on that. I, I think the single most important, the, the largest selling drug in the world are the statins. And I think it's uh, fundamentally was an understanding of familial hypercholesterolemia that sort of led to the whole rationalization of that. I think we're about to see tremendous pharmaceutical uh, drugs that actually will treat Alzheimer's disease because a couple of people a few years ago discovered the presenilins. The bottom line is that the only way that we have today to connect uh, physiology uh, to a gene in, in a human system is through genetic disease. And that bit of information gives you purchase on the problem that allows you to sort of pursue down in a rational way, potentially therapeutic. So, you know, whether, whether so from, in one sense, you're right, big pharma companies generally do not care about rare autosomal recessive diseases. The reality is they probably should care. And the reason they should care is that that is, those are the entry points that really give rise to, to, fundamental, to fundamental biology. And, and that's, I think, more of an issue in terms of understanding at one level than it is of, of reality. So I, that's why I, I'm, forever supportive of whatever research is done in the human genetics community because I think that's the essential information I need uh, to, to think about developing drugs. Well, I wanted to switch gears from money to research a little bit. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, you mentioned David Gilbert twice in your talk, and we are trying to define what we will be doing in the next 20 years. Gilbert was very successful in defining what all mathematicians will be doing in the next 50 years, mm -hmm. and he's done it simply by formulating 20 open problems. So do you think that genomics really come to the, came to the point when we can formulate 20 Gilbert problems in genomics and so just let everybody work on this so it's a little bit too early? And if we wanted, if the time really has come to this, then we should really learn a little bit about the standards of, farm, of about culture of open problems in computational sciences and uh, the much uh, less known part of Gilbert work is that he moved to Göttingen, was, right. which was the center of German physics at this time, and miserably failed to understand that physics is, will become the biggest science of 20th century. But what he's really done, he brought the culture of open questions to physics. And physics also followed this paradigm of open questions. So if we really think that genomics has come to the point when we can formulate open problems, then we should learn from Gilbert and probably from physicists what open problem means. For example, let's crack the combinatorial code of the genome is not an open problem in Gilbert terms. So what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I, don't, I, I think part of the, I, I, would, I would be the first person to agree. I mean, I mean the, uh, I, I guess my talk or my thoughts is provoked by some of the decisions I had to make in building my current organization. And what I found is that one of the best ways to push people to get to more specificity is to trivialize what they're currently doing. So, so, so by eliminating all the tasks that have occupied our time, you create a crisis. And some people will not do well in that crisis. Some people say, well, now I've got to work on the next hard problem or else I don't have a job. And I think we're just too early. We're at the sort of sticks and stones stage in biological research compared to where we are in physics. Uh, we, had, we had this discussion last night at the bar. I mean, I think we're back where the uh, pre-Darwinian days in terms of people thinking about how organisms fall into various phylogenetic trees and just collecting enough information of sufficient quality that you can actually begin to think of things in a way that is sufficiently quantitative and sufficiently accurate to, to really have open, to have problems in the mathematical sense. So. Uh, a part of the reason for bringing up Hilbert was, you know, I always admired that he, he really came up with the idea of the axiomatization of all sciences. And I think really we're at the first stages of the building the necessary tools that hopefully will let us get to that point. So I think you're right on target. And that's probably, if I can see the motion up here, the place we're going to end. Thank you. I think so.